this week on the Back Table Podcast. Your time is valuable. It's incredibly valuable. You should push back on unilateral expansion of your duties, things that either make that time far more stressful or simply expand the amount of time that you're required to apply through the number of obligations and understand just how, how that impacts your life. I see a lot of physicians that come to me after being employed by hospitals for an extended period that uh, really the first thing I have to do is bring them back into reality. Like, no, 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 that is unfair. What they're saying to you is just not right. Your time is valuable. You should not be required to do all of these things for free. And we need to reset that relationship a little bit. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT Podcast, where we discuss all things ENT, and we bring you the best and brightest in our field, with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. My name is Varun Varadarajan, and I'm a neurotologist in private practice in Denver, Colorado. Today, we are going to be talking about negotiating the physician employment contract. Many of our audience members may have listened to one of my previous episodes about finding your first job. We discuss a lot of great topics, some of which we're going to dive into a little deeper in today's episode. We have with us today, Michael Johnson of Michael Johnson Legal. He is a business lawyer that focuses his virtual law practice on helping physicians evaluate, negotiate, and enforce their employment contracts. His website is physiciancontracts.com and his Instagram handle is at physiciancontracts, where he posts helpful educational information for physicians. He has firsthand experience with physician contracts and how they can affect a physician's life. His wife is actually a psychiatrist, and they have personally lived through the important transition from residency to the first post-training job. His mission is for every physician to understand and negotiate the first contract and every contract thereafter. Michael, welcome to the show. Please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what your practice is like. That's such a kind intro. Thank you. I'm one of those rare lawyers that really love what they practice and who they represent, representing physicians, understanding, negotiating, enforcing physician contracts has been an incredibly rewarding way to practice law. Uh, I started my solo practice in 2019. I left a uh, larger downtown practice in New Orleans with the birth of our first child. My wife was in residency, finishing up her last year of training. We were looking at jobs and uh, looking at this transition. I started representing physicians shortly after I met my wife. I met her in 2016 during the last year of medical school. So I got to live all through residency, all through training, uh, and watched a lot of her colleagues, some of the upper levels, kind of struggle through understanding what physician contracting is like, what's the deal, uh, what are the pros and cons of different practice types and how to do this. Uh, and there wasn't a lot out there. So I figured it was a good area for me to build upon my business law background and help physicians with their contracts. We live in the Milwaukee area, but we represent physicians across the country. My colleague Esther is a lawyer based out of the New York City metro area. And we represent physicians evaluating and negotiating contracts all over, all specialties. And then there are a handful of states where we'll file lawsuits, we'll do things in person, uh, mostly in the Northeast, Louisiana, Texas, Wisconsin, New York, New Jersey, Maryland. There are a number of places that we'll do stuff in person. But the vast majority of our practice is representing physicians evaluating employment contracts. Awesome. You know. I'm of the mentality that a contract lawyer is essential, mostly just to understand what the contract is saying, to evaluate for red flags, although successfully negotiating for one or the other thing is also great, you know, asking for more things, I guess you could say. What, what is the biggest reason, in your opinion, from a physician's perspective, to hire a contract lawyer? It's important to understand the legal aspects of the relationship between you and your employer. Every contract's a little bit different. Every deal's a little bit different. There are pros and cons to every single employment contract I've ever read. But these contracts are not written in a way that's easy for physicians or really anybody without a legal background to understand. They're really written 
for lawyers and for courts and that sort of thing. So it can be challenging for a physician to pick up a 10 to 30 page employment agreement and really understand the pros and cons. And that's really step one with what we do. Before we get into the nitty gritty of negotiating, we really need to figure out what the deal is, what are the strengths and the weaknesses of this particular contract, and then help the physician understand what's most important to them. Every contract's a little bit different based on your personal preferences, family situation, career goals, all of that it has a big impact on what you negotiate. So figuring that out can be very challenging, particularly for a physician who only does it a couple times a decade, maybe, maybe even less than that. It really just depends. But uh, that's the best reason to hire a contract lawyer is to understand. So for new graduates or even somebody who's already in a career and has to move or find another job because their current job is not the right fit, what are the pros and cons of hiring a national company versus finding a lawyer locally where the physician plans to practice? Is there really a difference there? It depends. I think that uh, if you can find a lawyer in that city that has intimate knowledge of all the practices in your specialty and really knows the players, then that can certainly be very helpful. That is really hard to find, though. There are very few lawyers, frankly, that have a deep understanding of physician contracts, just general business lawyers or maybe someone who does like divorce or real estate. It's really hard for them to pick up a physician contract and spend an hour reading it and be able to advise you appropriately. So if you can find that diamond in the rough, then great. But for a practice like ours, we see hundreds of contracts in all types of specialties, all subspecialties across the country. So the odds of us not being able to help you fully or serve what you, what you need uh, is relatively low. So I'd say step one is just to make sure that the lawyer that you hire to serve you understands physician contracts and takes the time to work with you on a personal level. At its core, if a lawyer really is unable to dedicate that time to helping you understand uh, and evaluate, then that's also not going to help you as much. So uh, while it is important to have someone who might have some knowledge about your area, the country, your region, I think knowledge about physician contracts is most important. On your Instagram page, yeah, you know, I read about the trinity of physician contracts. Can you describe what are the three basic elements of a physician contract and go a little bit into each of those? Yeah, absolutely. So when you pick up a contract, we need to know what you're being compensated, what you must do to obtain that compensation the obligation sections, and how you would leave that job. Those questions on the surface seem really easy, right? Like that should be really easy to figure out. Like, why do you need a lawyer for that? But for physician contracts, those are really difficult questions. Compensation plans can be all over the place. It can have a lot of moving parts. Some are based on collections or productivity, or some have a flat salary and a lot of moving parts, okay? So Understanding the pros and cons of each type of compensation plan can be really challenging to just read. Sometimes these things can span three, five pages. But then you also have to compare that to the obligations. What are you required to do to obtain that compensation? Sometimes I pick up contracts and it's like you have to do anything that the employer says and we pay you X. That's really challenging for me because I really want to be able to understand what must the physician do day to day? What are they going to be obligated to do so I can advise them whether that mix of compensation and obligations is fair and appropriate? You just tell me a number for compensation. I don't know if it's a good deal or not. I have to compare it to what you're required to do, uh, what mix of obligations are asked of you before I can tell or advise you whether the deal is good. And then both of those items it's challenging for me to lock an employer into a specific mix of compensation and obligations for a really long time. Just the nature of physician work and your contracts is such that those are always a little bit malleable. Okay, we can reduce the flexibility and we can improve them. But there's always going to be some sort of flex, but the leverage and exit pieces 
how you leave a job is usually locked in in the first contract and almost never gets better in any renewal, any future negotiation. Your employer has next to zero motivation to make it easier for you to take your value from their employment to somewhere else. Okay. So I like to focus on the leverage and exit pieces in the first contract because that is going to help you so much with future negotiations about compensation, future negotiations about obligations. And just like a general overview, I'm talking about the non-compete, obviously. That's probably the most famous. But for the vast majority of contracts, that's not the most like punitive, challenging piece of your exit strategy. It can be. But it's not always the case. There's non-solicits, tons of details about non-solicit agreements with respect to patients and coworkers and even referral sources. Sometimes non-solicit or referral sources is the most restricted piece of the exit strategy. You have malpractice tail expenses. Usually there's some sort of compensation clawback piece. It's really hard to leave a physician employment contract unscathed. So we need to evaluate how much you're going to have to give up uh, in compensation, what opportunities you're going to waive if you have to leave. And then there's usually other details that come in that make exit for an agreement challenging. So we need to map out if you're unhappy with that job, if your employer changes compensation or obligations in a way that makes the job unattractive to you, how painful is it to exit? If you can leave relatively unscathed, then your hand, your negotiation hand in the future on comp and obligations is much stronger. So that's really what the Trinity is about. I love cooking. I'm from Louisiana. So most people think the Trinity is, you know, onions and bell pepper and celery. But (laughs) uh, it's certainly that for me as well. But it's also the Trinity of physician contracts. That's awesome. And that's a great sort of lens to look at contracts through when you are just beginning started, when you're a physician before you even take your first contract to your lawyer, at least getting an understanding of these three elements is important just to summarize, you know, compensation, obligations, and leverage slash exit strategy. Exactly. So, you know, for physicians going into surgery or surgical subspecialties, What would you say is the breakdown you've seen with regards to type of practice? So, you know, there's very different contracts in every career scenario, in every employment scenario. So private practice, academics, or hospital employed. And there's, you know, hybrid models as well, but I would like to discuss some red flags and risks for each of these environments. But, you know, what would you say is a breakdown you've seen in regards to the contract that you've negotiated for physicians? Yeah, so I see uh, surgeons and folks in surgical specialties go into all three. It's really just up to you And uh, there's a lot more that is similar between the different environments than different, frankly. So you can evaluate all three of those, I guess, categories, if you will, through the Trinity to evaluate what your options are. So starting with private practice, if we're going through the Trinity, we're looking at it from a very bird's eye view. We want to look at the initial compensation offering but also the future compensation offering. Usually the first like base salary that they offer you is really not the end of negotiations. I see a lot of first contract physicians who have maybe only been employed, maybe with like a little summer side gig, but haven't worked in like corporate America, haven't worked outside of medicine. And maybe their only other job, their only other income has been through the residency or fellowship program. They're used to getting a flat salary in a biweekly manner. So any other model seems very foreign. I think just getting comfortable with that uh, on the front end is very important. And then understanding what future comp looks like. If you're going into private practice, you're often thinking, okay, The salary right now is really not what the salary is going to be in the future. I should expect it to be higher. And if you compare just compensation on a very macro level to academics and hospital employed, I would usually expect private practice salaries to start off maybe the same or lower, but then finish higher over time. So I know there's a number of other elements of private practice that we want to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of want to start with what the risks are. 
of private practice. You know, being in private practice myself, it was a big decision for me to choose this path over the academic or hospital employed path. But let's talk about some of the risks of being in private practice. And one of the things you mentioned was, you know, how you're going to get compensated with private practice. You worry about overhead. You not only have to cover your costs, but you also have to make a salary for yourself, cover the operating costs of the entire office, all the staff in the office, match their retirement accounts. You know, there's a, there's a lot of other pieces to it that you don't think about when you're a resident or a fellow. But, you know, one of the big risks of private practice is practice failure. So let's talk about that risk and why may some practices fail? Unlike a big hospital system or a university, that's usually not going to fail. Correct. Correct. Look, the big hospitals and the academic centers, they usually have uh, a lot more secure financial backing. And most hospitals are like allegedly nonprofit, but sometimes they make a lot of money. We can talk about that <laughs> a little bit later. But but yeah, you have just business risks of private practice. You know, some businesses are super successful. Some businesses fail. Uh, just a general risk of capitalism is that some get priced out. So I see some practices uh, struggling to keep up with their hospital-based counterparts when the hospital is adding physicians in that specialty. If they're maybe drying up some of the referral sources for that private practice by bringing it in-house. And remember these hospitals, they do have uh, a larger operation. It's sometimes a little bit easier for them to pay a physician more on the front end. Usually, a physician several years into their practice might not do as well compensation-wise in a hospital setting, but in the very beginning, it's a little bit easier for hospitals to stomach that initial like cost of bringing on a physician. So because of that, some private practices start to struggle to compete with uh, local hospitals and their, their other counterparts. Sometimes a new practice grows into another space. They open up a new office and they bring in new physicians and they invest in a bunch of marketing efforts. And sometimes the business just gets gobbled up by competition. Yeah, there's just a number of ways. Sometimes practices, if the current owners are nearing retirement and there's not like a steady flow replacing them of new physicians, then there might be a motivation to either sell or stop growth and close up or I guess the practice going in a different direction. So it really just depends. No, th these are good points. And you mentioned, you know, the competition of a big hospital system, whether it be university or a mega health system, but beyond just direct competition, there's also the insurance contracts. And so the insurance contracts for the bigger systems are going to be much better than small and medium private practices. And unless a, a private practice is part of a larger group of other practices that are valued together, have enough of a monopoly or a, a stake in the market that the insurance companies and commercial payers are willing to have good negotiation contracts with them. And I'm sure it's better in rural areas, right, than major cities. But that's another piece of it that's a downside to being in private practice. You have to worry about insurance contracts, negotiate your insurance contracts. And that's not something that you have control over when you're looking at your employment agreement with the private practice. But how much is it reasonable to even look into that, you know, when you're deciding to join a private practice and negotiating the contract? Are those questions something you ask the practice about, you know, what have you guys done for insurance contract negotiations? You know, have you had success, you know, getting a better multiplier for your reimbursement? Absolutely. Understanding the economic underpinnings of that particular practice can be really important to your decision making. If you're going to go in the private practice direction, you want to at least have an understanding of their negotiating leverage against their insurers, the folks that pay them, having a general idea of how long out their accounts receivables are. Sometimes it can take a really long time oh, to get paid by insurance companies. This is one of the biggest challenges that private practices face is not like the amount that they pay a physician to do a service and then what they ultimately get paid by the payor. It's that gap in time. It's really hard from a financial standpoint to pay a physician right away, but then have to wait on payment for an extended period. And maybe it gets negotiated down, it gets pushed back. And the smaller private practice is, sometimes uh, there's some pressures to agree to lower rates and to not have quite the negotiating leverage that you would want. I get this question quite a lot from small independent private practices 
about negotiating against insurers. I often hear from a practice standpoint that they're happier, they enjoy the autonomy and the control over their practice. There are many advantages, don't get me wrong, for smaller independent private practices, but potentially one of the disadvantages is fighting with insurance and fighting with payors. Totally. And, you know, the disadvantages are something we definitely need to talk about from both ends because that's where the contract negotiation plays a big role. We often hear about private practices taking advantage of newly graduated physicians, especially in desirable locations. If you really want to live somewhere, they have the upper hand. Sometimes they give a low salary, no clear path to partnership. And we can talk about partnership soon too here uh, with an aggressive non-compete. You know, if you really want to live somewhere and there are not many options, I can imagine that a number of compromises are made by new physicians who just want to be there. And they'll, I don't want to say get taken advantage of by the private practice, but it, it's almost what's happening in some situations. No, absolutely. I love negotiating some differences in the legal enforcement of the contract during a partnership track. If someone is bringing you on, if a practice is bringing you on in a partnership track, we want to know how long that track is, and how often physicians in that track are ultimately offered partnership. A big red flag for me is if it's a relatively questionable partnership track. If not everyone is offered partner, then what are we doing here? Why are folks either turning down partnership or being turned away after spending a few years, maybe sacrificing a few years early in their career? We want to know, understand why. But partnership can mean many different things in different practices. Sometimes there's large buy-ins, large payouts. It's a big financial difference between the employment agreement and the partnership. Sometimes if you have a large practice that is offering like a partnership, sometimes they'll even say it in the contract that it's more of a partnership in name, closer to an employment agreement. Maybe there's a small buy-in and a small piece of additional compensation over time for partners. And then maybe you get a small like buyout piece, but it really doesn't change the relationship in a fundamental way. So a lot of physicians, first contract physicians will come to me with a pre-partnership deal, but they haven't asked like, what is partnership? Like, what is the difference between the deals? So sometimes you have to go back and explore that a little bit deeper. Understanding also if, if future partnership is a big reason that the physician is taking the job then I want to know how secure it is, how lucrative it is, and then also try to soften the exit if that ultimately doesn't pan out. Most physician employment agreements, the first offer that you get will have the same non-compete, non-solicit, same termination clauses, same everything, regardless if the practice offers you partnership or not. A good thing to negotiate is to consider, okay, if the practice, for whatever reason, decides that I am not to be a partner, then maybe ask for the non-compete to be reduced or removed. Maybe consider even the non-solicit. If the practice offered you a signing bonus, something substantial, maybe something that waives that signing bonus payback. Usually if you get a signing bonus, it's not like a sports star where you can break your leg the next day and you get to keep the money. It's really like an advance on future income. It's not free money. So if there is a payback piece that would occur like after the partnership agreement is signed, then you might want to consider negotiating for the practice to eat those costs if they don't offer you partnership. Through your negotiating on the front end, you can make it uh, a little bit more painful for the practice to not offer you partnership. So that's a good way to start. No, these are really good points about the partnership. And speaking of partner tracks, Although many would argue, like sort of like we're hinting at now, is that the reason you would go into private practice is to become a partner one day. But that's really not everyone's goal. Not everyone's interested in becoming a partner. There are more and more physicians who want to be employed, you know, even by a private practice. Who would this be good for? I think it would have been good for our family, actually. As an example, we moved to Milwaukee, to Wisconsin, but we met in New Orleans we weren't entirely certain where we want to ultimately raise our family. If you're going to go into a private practice and looking at a partnership arrangement, 
then you're probably committed to that geographic region to staying there for a really long time. So if you have any questions, if you're unsure about where you want to live long term, then a partnership track might not be best for you. Some physicians are looking at like FIRE, like financial independence, retire early. Some might not be looking at a 30, 40, 50 year career. Some might want to take various breaks and travel or experience living in other areas of the country. And all of those like personal decisions, those personal goals aren't super correlated with being an owner of a business that is located in one place. Also, some people don't want to own a business. They don't want that ongoing commitment. When you sign up for a partnership, there's usually some pressures, some obligations to continue practicing, practice at a high level with quite a lot of long-term commitment. So if that's not you, then employment contracts might be much better. Even like locum contracts might be much better. I've worked through this with physicians that are looking at different types of practice, how they're wanting to contract for work. They start off with a private practice partnership track, but just for personal reasons, they say, you know what? A locum's contract might be better. A hospital employed because I can get out of it and move around and get back in relatively quickly with a somewhat stable and high compensation, that might be better for me. It really just depends on what your life goals are. One of the questions I like to ask very early on if a, if a physician is looking to hire our law firm to help represent them, I ask them, what do you want life to be like? Because the answer to that question might affect whether you want to go into private practice or academics or hospital employed or just be employed by a private practice. Yeah. And, you know, early on in your career, private practice is not going to be a cakewalk. You have to build a practice. You have to learn to cover your costs, learn on a week to week or month to month basis how busy you can and want to be and what that looks like for what your income is going to be. And not only when you're employed, it's nice because, you know, you can look at the numbers and imagine what it would be like if you're a partner. And you don't want to necessarily find that out once you're a partner and maybe even realize that the competition goes down. And so for those who want to be a partner, you know, what are the pros and cons of this? You know, we talked a little bit about covering your costs. We talked about the buy-in, you know, let's talk about the buy-in. If it's a huge buy-in that you have to prepare for, a lot of us already have student loans. And if you're going to have to do a big buy-in, whether it be all up front or through sweat equity or a gradual payments through your collections, what are some ways that a buy-in is even calculated? That is such an important question, something that every first contract physician needs to know before they sign that first agreement is how is that buy-in calculated? There's really three main categories, fair market value, book value, and par value. Par value and book value are typically a lower number. Fair market value is typically a higher value. Book value speaks to the assets of the company minus the liabilities, and it comes out to a number uh, per share, an amount that you're going to pay per share. It does not consider like future income, goodwill of the business, uh, some of the other things that like maybe a private equity firm or if like you are buying it on the open market the price would be higher. Book value is going to be a little bit lower. Par value is when the operating agreement or the shareholder agreement for the practice just states a number per share. Let's say each there's a thousand shares, 10 physicians, they own a hundred shares each, and they're going to call it $10 per share. That $10 per share is not tied to any particular value. It's just a number that's determined on the front end. That's how much it's worth when you buy in. Fair market value speaks to what a willing buyer and a willing seller would agree to on the open market. And that would consider, likely consider some multiple of revenue. That's gonna be a higher number. There are pros and cons to all three of those. The more money you're going to get when you buy out, when you sell your ownership interest as you retire, that's actually a really good question to make sure that the buy-in and the, the sale price are the same. Uh, if a practice, for some reason, does those differently, then that's a bit of a, a, a red flag for me. A high fair market value buy-in, I think, 
might help the practice retain its independence and maybe reduce the incentive to explore a purchase by private equity. But when the purchase value from an exiting physician to someone in the partnership track is relatively low, then for me, that's a bit of a risk factor for purchase from private equity. If the exiting physician really needs a different type of buyer to extract value upon retirement, then that could affect that. I realize we're touching on private equity. There's recently a really great podcast on Backtable. Uh, I just listened to it yesterday. That was just so exceptional talking about the ins and outs of private equity. Uh, I encourage anybody interested in this, really anybody that's looking into private practice needs to have an understanding of what private equity is, understand the basics of pros and cons. And that podcast is a great place to start. Oh yeah. I love that episode. And I love that you summarize that, you know, fair market value, book value, or par value. These aren't necessarily terms the practice is going to use when they talk to you about buying it. Sometimes if you feel that the buy-in is exorbitantly high, you know, have you ever heard of anyone doing a practice valuation to see if it's justified? Is that frowned upon typically? I guess if you're considering buying a whole practice, if you're buying a solo practice, then a practice valuation is sort of needed. But if you're just joining a group of physicians who own a practice, I've personally never heard of someone doing a practice valuation, but have you heard of that or seen that? They're all a little bit different. I just want my client who's looking at paying a buy-in to be paying under the same calculation as the physicians that came before and based on the same calculation as whatever it is upon exit. So I don't want that to be changing, switching around over time. Some I've seen where both the physician coming in or the exiting physician or the practice have the right to hire their own expert and then compare expert reports and all of that. And that can certainly make sense in certain type of practices, don't get me wrong, but I like uh, and I prefer for the method to be relatively consistent over time, whatever that is. Yeah. And I like some of the things you brought up of the buyout, not only when you retire, but if you need to move somewhere and you bought in a bunch and you, you, you at least should get that back. If the share value had increased since you started, at least you want to get back roughly the amount that you bought in to the practice. I also want to talk about when is it not a good idea to buy into a partnership? We talked about that even being a red flag of multiple employees not becoming partner, being turned down partnership, or people you know just not wanting to make that transition. For example, if you switch over to collections and you become a partner and you're not busy enough, you're not going to be a successful partner. Similarly, if a practice wants you to become a partner in a short period of time, you know they want you to buy in. Could this be because they don't want to or cannot cover that guaranteed salary for a prolonged period? this coming out of their paychecks, the individual partners currently, or maybe they just want you to help cover the overhead equally, regardless of what your salary will look like as a partner afterwards. You know, these are reasons that you may not want to jump into a partnership until the practice is built well enough. Unless you have a cash pay based practice or the ancillary revenue is overwhelmingly successful, you know, the partnership track should give you enough time to build a practice enough that you can you know, roughly make however much you're making in your guaranteed salary at least. You don't know what life's going to throw at you. You know, New physicians are moving to a new city. Sometimes they have young families or you want to buy a house in a ridiculous housing market right now. And then you got to be told <laughs> about a big buy-in into a private practice on top of your student loans. And you may just want some time to not have to think about that, right? What are your thoughts on, on this perspective of you know, waiting to become a partner, not rushing that whole process. You're hitting the nail on the head. The most likely reason that you might need to call me or a lawyer to help you exit a partnership in the short term is if you got in too early in your practice, your volume was not enough to support the overhead and your other financial obligations to the practice. If you're not quite there yet and the practice is pushing you to become partner, uh, that's a bit of a risk factor for me that might suggest that the other partners are also not making enough uh, to cover overhead, that some of the underlying financials are not as secure as they would like, and they need more physicians to share overhead to make it more profitable for the other partners in the practice. So watch out for that. 
you want to maybe take a look at your finances, your collections and say, okay, if I switched over now to the partnership model, whatever their compensation, their financial arrangement is between each other, would I make enough to support my salary? Would I start making more or would I have a dip in compensation? If I'm working with like some more cash pay type practices, maybe like plastics or derm or something like that, then I think that shorter practice like ramp up times kind of make more sense. Sometimes they even negotiate uh, in the partnership and the employment agreement that the option to become partner might be triggered when the physician out earns X, whatever X number is. That's a great thing to consider negotiating. But yeah, so if you're in a surgical specialty and you're moving to a new place and it's just a type of practice that takes time to build, then you don't want to jump in too quick because it could actually be worse for you financially. Yeah. And the partnership agreement, you know, once you become a partner is also a very different type of document than your employment agreement when you start. And we probably don't have too much time to discuss this today. But I think one of the important points to hit here is that an exit strategy, just like with the employment agreement, is important. And same thing with the whole non-compete. We'll talk about non-compete in a little bit too. But do you have any other thoughts on you know the partnership agreement for our listeners? No, absolutely. So exiting a partnership agreement in the short term within the first few years of you becoming partner can be very painful. Usually the non-compete is worse. There's usually some sort of financial component. Maybe you paid, especially under a fair market value, buy-in, if the buy-in is a really high number, then if you leave in the short term, usually you can't extract all of that money. Usually you have to give up some funds. So you might end up on the negative if you leave that practice in the short term. Usually if you leave too, you are restricted with the non-solicit. All the referral sources and the relationships that you developed might not really be able to come with you. You might have to leave the geographic region such that you're basically starting off from scratch and you bought in and you weren't able to buy out at the same value that you bought in. So you might have even lost money in that scenario. And now you're moving. It can be very painful. So before you get into a partnership agreement, you should really take some time and understand what happens if things go wrong during at least the first five years, let's say and have a plan for what that exit would look like. Make sure the family's on board too, because if you have a bunch of moving parts, is if there's a chance that you're going to really have to leave town to your family situation might change in a very meaningful way in the short term, then that might be a bit of a risk factor for you. So many issues at play. But yeah, we could have probably a whole podcast on evaluate that exit strategy as a young partner. It's a very kind of dangerous time. That's a, that's a great podcast topic. <laughs> but um, another thing about being a partner, what about things like ancillary revenue? That's supposed to be one of the benefits of being a partner. Obviously, decision-making ability, some more autonomy. This may not be true for a, general, a group of general ENT practices, but some folks subspecialize. And when there's different specialties contributing to ancillary revenues in different ways, for example, allergy or audiology, if you're an ear specialist like me, you're probably going to contribute a lot more to audiology and hearing aid sales. Whereas if you're a sinus specialist, you're contributing a lot more in terms of allergy tests and allergy immunotherapy. Is this something that you need to know well in advance before you join the practice? Or is this something you can still negotiate when you're going to become a partner? How the ancillary revenue is divided? What is a reasonable compensation formula for that? No, absolutely. I see practices uh, calculate who gets what in so many different ways. Some will say, if you're a partner, you're an equal partner. Let's say there's 10 physicians in the partnership. Everyone owns 10%. They get 10% of all the ancillary revenue, regardless of what specialty they're in, how much they contribute to it, what they do, like a very, not to use this in like a pejorative way, think, but more of like a socialistic, like everybody gets an equal piece of that. Well, with that, I mean, there's also, I believe, New Stark Law, where if it's a certain number of physicians in a practice, you have to divide that equally. Am I wrong about that or? Correct. Correct. It's like pods. They like get around the self-referral issues with DHS services through pods. So you have Stark law requirements. Uh, the practice really should have good legal advice coming in on the regulatory changes. It's an incredibly complex area of the law. Yeah. 
and every small practice should have someone to go to. While I do some of that stuff, I do not do that for practices, but very important for practices to stay on top of that. But yeah, so there's that. And then, yeah, it just depends on how they separate those ancillary services. If it's more of like an even democratic way of doing it or how they they organize the pods. If it's a bigger practice, then being in one pod could be better than being in another one. They could do it based on geography. Tons of details. It's hard for us even to like identify all the questions on the front end. You really need to start asking questions, listen to responses from the practice, and then understand a little bit about the economic underpinnings of private practices, and then no follow-up questions to ask after that. Yeah, that's another point that could probably be in its own episode by itself. <laughs> Absolutely. Going back to compensation, you mentioned earlier how it can take time for insurances to pay you for services rendered. You know, that's one of the things I only learned about private practice after starting. When you're a resident and a fellow and you talk to only your mentors who are in employed positions, they do get to see their collections, but their paycheck's coming no matter what based on RVUs, right? So on the private practice side, where RVUs are not the metric for reimbursement, the payer mix plays a role in your collections. You know, I could do a procedure and then I may not know if I'm going to get paid for it for like 90 days. You know, and I'm maybe sounding a bit hyperbolic, but you're just hoping that you're going to get reimbursed for something that you do. The liability starts immediately and the compensation, you don't know when it's going to come. And that's one thing that if you're joining a private practice is to know what their, you know, administrative staff infrastructure is like to know that there's people battling insurance denials, there's people following up to make sure that you're getting reimbursed for the services you're providing. But going back to payer mix, you know, this plays a big role. There can be a, a variety of reimbursement for the same procedure, depending on the payer. You know, is it okay if you're a new physician starting out to ask for the payer mix distribution to see what it's like between the providers, ask if it's divided evenly on the providers? You know, no one likes talking about money. You're, you're coming out of residency or fellowship. You're not even thinking about the insurance for the patient unless it determines what their insurance covers as far as a procedure you can do. But you're not thinking about it in the terms of how much you're collecting for the practice that contributes toward your overhead to eventually bring a salary home for yourself. How openly discussed is the payer mix distribution in contract negotiations? Yeah, so I like to at least know something about how the physician is going to be compensated somewhat early on. I don't need to know all the details or what the base salary is during the first conversations. The first handful of conversations should focus on fit, type of work that you're doing, that sort of thing. But before you sign the first employment agreement, I would like to know something about how collectible their bills are, especially if they're going to compensate you based on collection. Even in an employee position before you're a partner, as soon as any portion of your compensation is based on collections, you should, in your mind, think that now I'm paid on collections, okay? Your compensation goes up when you create more collections. It goes down when you have fewer collections. PTO is not paid. The P kind of goes away because whenever you are not working or doing something that leads to a collection, you're not earning more money. You might have a floor compensation in your salary model that is enough to sustain you, but the increase and decrease in your compensation is based on collections. So it's very important to understand what do they do with new patients that come in? If a patient comes into the practice, and is not already assigned. Or if the physician that they're trying to come to doesn't have any more room, their panel's full, they can't see that patient, what happens to that patient? Is it routed based on the payor, whether they have a high paying insurance or maybe they're a little bit more low paying like a Medicare Medicaid? Uh, is there any kind of consideration on how collectible the payment is? And does that have any impact on where that patient goes? If it goes to the most recent physician in the door, or if it happens to go to one of the partners that happens to have some open space in their panel, does it go to them? That distribution can have a huge impact on comparing the amount of your obligations, the volume of work that you provide, and your compensation. If you do 
more work for higher paying payors. Well, guess what? You're going to be compensated higher per unit of work per unit of effort, right? But if the practice doesn't distribute that evenly or it favors it in a different way, then that can be really challenging. It's challenging too in this space because I might see more of a mix based on some gender and race inequalities. So if you're looking at how to maybe secure your salary, if you have some concerns about maybe a female physician or a a minority physician, maybe being compensated unfairly or or maybe a little bit less than their other counterparts, uh, this might be a really good place to look. I have some theories that the distribution based on payor mix isn't always even among gender and race, uh, maybe not intentionally, but it happens. I think it's something to look out for. That's a, that's a good point. And you know, part of the reason of all of this may be due to the, the reason you're being employed. Are you being employed because of practice growth and that scenario you described where what happens to a new patient, where are they routed versus are you replacing a retiring physician? Because the patients directly referred to the senior physicians are not going to go to the new doctor unless a senior physician is retiring. And so if that person's retiring, you're taking their place, you are going to adopt their payor mix. And that's one thing I think it's important when you ask. And we mentioned that in the other podcast too. Like, why are they looking to hire somebody? Is it practice growth or are you replacing somebody? And there's pros and cons of either of those. You know, another thing I wanted to talk about when being employed by a private practice is the use of hospital recruitment agreements. I want to talk about some of the pros and cons of this. From your perspective, have you seen a lot of hospital recruitment agreements? You know, have you seen practices mostly pay out of pocket completely for a new employee? I want to hear a little bit about your experience with that. I see a little bit of both. Um, I probably see fewer hospital recruitment agreements compared to private practices, uh, independent private practices that are able to support the salaries. I think maybe some private practices that have private equity backing are probably unlikely to need hospital recruitment agreements as much as their fully independent counterparts, maybe. But there's pros and cons. I believe a hospital recruitment agreement is more likely to help a practice offer a competitive salary. It can be really hard for a ton of the reasons that we already discussed so far for a practice to support that physician's salary. In the very beginning, a hospital recruitment agreement is a promise by the hospital to cover a portion or all of that physician's salary or maybe even overhead associated with that physician until that physician uh, is established. The hospital benefits because they want to have specialists that have relationships with the hospital close by. They want referrals. They want the local market to be able to support a number of specialists. So that's why they do it. They want to secure access to physicians that they need to serve the patients that come see them. Private practices also need that support because it's really expensive bringing on a new physician, particularly if they are competing directly with hospitals and sometimes even academic centers. Hospitals and academic centers can sometimes more easily take a loss during the first couple years of a physician's practice compared to a private practice because They're just so much bigger. You go look at some of the numbers and the budgets and one physician is a relatively small blip on their profit and loss statements, their balance sheets. But for a small private practice, bringing on a new physician when there's only six physicians in the practice can be a pretty significant financial barrier to growth. Uh, And some hospitals want to support local private practices to grow. So that's a point. So those are some of the pros. There's often a limit on the non-compete that can be imposed by the practice under a hospital recruitment agreement. The hospital wants that physician to stay in the area. But if that physician wants to leave the practice, the practice would probably prefer that physician to leave the area so they don't have to compete with them, right? But under the hospital recruitment agreement, the hospital wants a fair shot of a return on their investment. So they'll push back on that a little bit and will want the physician to stay in the local area. So a challenge with a hospital recruitment agreement is that you have an extra cook in the kitchen. Usually it's just the relationship between the physician 
and the practice, or the physician and the employer. But now you have like a tripart relationship. There's three people in there. So it can get a little bit more complicated. I think that anybody considering a hospital recruitment agreement in addition to an employment contract, that that's how the practice is going to bring you on. You should really take a little bit more time, make sure you hire a lawyer that looks at these and understands these because there can be important details that matter. Hospital recruitment agreements are definitely not meant to be read by lay people. If you've ever tried to read one of these, they're often very, very dry and not easy to pull on. So I think a lot of what you see in a hospital recruitment agreement is discussing the funds between the hospital and the practice itself. So it's not even money that you're even technically involved in. Well, obviously you're the reason for the cost, right? But a lot of it, I think, will be how the practice is going to pay back the hospital for certain things, how much the hospital is going to be willing to cover. Probably not overhead in most cases, I would imagine. Maybe they'll only cover a certain amount that results in your guaranteed salary for that month. But once you reach that amount with your collections, maybe they won't give any contribution at that level. There's probably a bunch of different varieties there, but I was interested to see if you've had experience with that. And what about historical data? Like have the, if the practice has used hospital recruitment agreements successfully before, I'm assuming that's a good question to ask, right? And if, or is it the first time that's being done? for this physician is that maybe that's a red flag because the practice can't afford to hire a physician on their own. Or if they've successfully, you know, hired multiple physicians in the past with HRAs, right? And each one was a success story. Right. Yeah. I love to investigate the history behind the, the hospital recruitment agreement. If the vast majority of physicians that do this are able to cover their income, cover their compensation relatively quickly in the amount that the hospital has to dole out, to help them ramp up is relatively low and then it gets paid back or paid off relatively quickly, then all of those are good signs. That means that uh, the arrangement is doing what it's supposed to do. It's working. But if the practice was recently independent, but now for whatever reason really needs a hospital recruitment agreement, then we got to ask a few more questions about why that is. If they can't explain it very clearly to you how quickly they expect to be able to no longer need to pull any funds from the hospital to cover your salary, then that can be a bit of a risk factor. Tons of like important details there. It can be challenging too to leave those agreements, particularly if you're behind, if you owe a duty to the hospital to pay back a certain portion of funds. If the job doesn't work out, it might add an extra layer of complexity to your exit strategy owing money back to the hospital and maybe having exit strategy issues with the practice can make a short-term exit unattractive. I think that physicians that are maybe going into their first job thinking that they might need to move within the first couple of years, physicians love to marry each other and it's really complicating for physician contracts because like y'all want to do different fellowships and move across the country and be like super mobile, especially during that like 30 to 40 age range when you're looking at these agreements. If if there's a chance or a, a likelihood that you might need to move in the first couple of years, hospital recruitment agreement is probably not a great, great way to go. Also, I would say be aware if you're planning on taking some time off to grow your family, if you're going to have a couple kids or you're planning on taking some time off for that, think about how that's going to be impacted by the hospital recruitment agreement. If you're receiving salary during that time, then that might simply be in advance on future earnings that you have to pay back. You're not really receiving maternity leave salary. You're potentially increasing your obligation to pay funds back to the hospital. So tons of personal finance decisions that go along with hospital recruitment agreements. Well, those are great points. And the last thing I want to mention about private practice before moving on to the academic and employed side and we talked about private equity a little bit before, and we talked about the awesome episode Backtable ENT had about it. Private equity, you know, you often hear the common opinions that if you're late in your career, you're already a partner for a while, it's a great gig, you know, it accelerates your retirement. But if you're early in your career, you know, depending on your EBITDA, you know, it's maybe not be the best financial decision over 10 to 20 years. On the flip side, if you're a new partner, and you got a bunch of student loans and a big house mortgage, all, all that stuff. And it may get you to financial independence faster 
where you don't even need that big of a salary once you're in a private equity group and to maintain at least the quality of life you have currently, or even better, if you're actually financially independent or living rent or mortgage free, et cetera. And so that's a very personal decision. It depends on the type of practice you're in, uh, the practice's history. But regardless of that, how do you figure out if a private practice is entertaining this when you're interviewing and doing your employment contract negotiations? When do you ask these questions during that process? And what are some clues, I guess, that could tell you that they're entertaining the private equity side of things? Yeah. So uh, I would not do it on day one. I would not do it on the first uh, <laughs> communication. If your first handful oh, yeah. of questions are about <laughs> private equity buyouts, then you might not be getting that job. They might not really be moving forward. So uh, it's tough, though, because it's an important question. It's an important consideration. I would say usually those conversations happen after the physician receives the first draft of the employment agreement. And there's maybe in writing some discussions about partnership track and some further discussions about what partnership means, what buy-in looks like, that sort of thing. A good question to ask is, have the partners voted on a purchase from private equity? Maybe they'll tell you, maybe not. You can offer to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, to discuss some of these more sensitive issues with a private practice. I'm in favor of that. Like if they want to open up their books to you or talk about some sensitive votes, some more sensitive details of the practice, I think that's great. If they want a strong NDA before they do that, I think that's totally appropriate. That's probably a good signal that it's time for you to bring in a lawyer to help you navigate that situation. Okay. But asking them if they voted on it, asking what the outcome was, what their motivating factors are. I think also understanding how this matters in private practice and having those conversations on the on a very professional and high level can also demonstrate value, your value to the practice. Practices certainly want great physicians, don't get me wrong. But if you can also establish that you know something about the business side, that you're not the typical green, wet behind the ears physician that doesn't understand anything other than practicing in your subspecialty, then that might actually add value. I think that physicians that own small practices, that are partners in small practices, might want other physicians that are in tune to those issues. So I don't want you anybody to shy away from those types of questions, but also have a little tact about when you ask them and how that request is going to be received. Uh, I think that there's some risk in a fundamental change in ownership during your partnership track and then during the first couple years of your partnership. If during the first couple years it is an advantage to you, whatever the deal is, is favorable to the most recent new partner in the practice, then great. Like you can vote however you want. Sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes it's disadvantageous to the newest partner. Sometimes the newest partner really wants to earn what they expect to earn as an independent private practice earn a little bit more during the first portion of their career. Uh, sometimes that deal changes during the partnership track. I've asked about some sort of, I guess, restrictions or changes in the non-compete, non-solicit and exit strategy issues. If the practice is purchased by private equity during the pre-partnership track, uh, that's something to at least explore. See if the deal that you initially think that you're going to be offered in the future changes in a fundamental way then maybe reducing the pain of exit from that deal could be a good negotiating point. But yeah, those are some of the high points. Well, Michael, that was a great discussion about the private practice side of things. And we talked about some of the risks and things to discuss in your contract negotiation for private practice. But I want to shift gears and talk about the academic medicine and employed models. You know, we started off talking about the risks of private practice, but what are some of the big risks of becoming an academic physician or a, an employed physician with a mega health hospital? Yeah. So first step is talking about academic contracts. Folks think that academic contracts are not negotiable. Nothing can be farther from the truth. I've had some of the most enjoyable, interesting negotiations with academic institutions, particularly on the mix of obligations side of things. 
Often a physician will consider an academic institution because they offer resources that are just not available in a small private practice, or they want to do research, or they want to try to tackle a certain issue or accomplish something that might not be rooted in collections and profits, right? So negotiating on obligations, understanding exactly what you're required to do for that academic institution can be very, very powerful. Now, if you're looking to go into academics and maybe have a different type of work expectation, but be compensated like you're at a high-speed private practice, that's not always super reasonable, okay? We can certainly negotiate on compensation with academic institutions, but that's often limited by some of the more senior folks within that academic institution, that department, uh, maybe having the exact same salary as you. Sometimes the physician that's been there for 10 or 15 years has the exact same deal as the newest addition to that department. So I see physicians looking to exit academic positions, often because there is a change in administration. And with the change in administration in academic jobs, there often comes some sort of shift in obligations. Something changes such that the reasons that that physician really wanted that particular job now are no longer true, and they want to look for something different. Sometimes physicians in academic jobs, if they're in more of a teaching role, they're watching the trainees just come and work for them for a couple of years and then immediately out earn them in the very first contract. And that can be really challenging to continue doing indefinitely. So from a compensation standpoint, some academic physicians might want to look at, look at something different. I see also if there starts to become some turnover in a department, then the obligations don't always go away. Sometimes they just need to be distributed more heavily on the physicians that are still there. If a department goes from 10 radiologists down to five, guess what? There might be twice as much work for every physician that's there. They might not actually reduce the workload according to the number of physicians that are available to do the work. I see like call schedules, for example, continue to be reduced and made more burdensome uh, without any additional compensation in academic jobs. So a good thing to negotiate on compensation is some sort of limit on obligations. Like, what are you required to do with the job? And if you're required to do more of a thing, then I like to at least ask or explore ways that we can say no and force them to go somewhere else, maybe hire locums or push it onto somebody else. Like, I'm a little bit selfish. When I'm representing a physician, I want a better deal for them first, right? Or at least get more compensation for it. Uh, it really just depends. And then it's a second issue is not all academic jobs are the same. If you think that you're getting a job that's focused on teaching and research, but your compensation model is ultimately going to be on RVUs or on collections, well, now you're only being compensated when you're doing things that lead to an RVU. So if you're teaching or if you're doing administrative duties or really anything that's not direct patient care leading to an RVU, then you're not being compensated for that. And you might be able to like try to justify it in your head, just say, overall, I make X and here are all the things that I'm required to do. But if over time, the administrative burdens continue to increase and it pushes you to either create more RVUs in less time or reduces the amount of clinical time that you have. And then all of a sudden your salary is being reduced, but the amount of time and energy that you're applying to the job is steadily increasing. That's going to lead to burnout. Like you're not going to be able to do that indefinitely. That's probably the most likely scenario that, that an academic employed physician is going to call me looking for something new. No, oh, that's a good point. And you know, another big risk is administrative change. Like if you join on there and the chairman goes to another university and there's a new chairman, have you seen physicians' jobs be profoundly affected just from leadership change? Very much so. Very much so. I see leadership changes sometimes leading to increased turnover within a department. And I can see that spiral quite quickly. 
So there have been instances where a few in the same same department are all kind of looking to leave at the same time for the same reason. And that can be really challenging. It almost has like a self-prophesizing effect because as one physician leaves, then the call goes down by one and then it makes it more burdensome and then another one leaves so then it's worse. And then more people are looking like, okay, well, what other deals are out there? Why are all of my colleagues exploring other options? And you look around and maybe there are better deals out there. So I can see that turnover, that change sometimes happening quite rapidly. Anybody in an academic position, when the administration is changing, I would at least take a look and understand what your next best option is. Take a look at the market and just be prepared just in case. uh, Stay current. Is there any way to poise yourself when you do the initial contract negotiation for an obligation change when the administration turns over? Is there anything you can do to protect yourself and your obligations? Yeah. So when you're negotiating an academic job, I love trying to get as many details about your deal into the written contract. Academic contracts can come in a bunch of different forms. Sometimes they look just the same as private practice employment agreements or big hospital employed agreements. But sometimes they look more like a memorandum of understanding, like a letter kind of written between two friends that just discuss some general outlines of the deal. Sometimes they don't read and feel like a legal document. Sometimes it's more like a letter. Regardless, whatever's written in there is what makes up your contract. Sometimes academic contracts also include like a physician manual or an employment handbook that actually has all the other I guess you'd say primary physician employment contract issues. Sometimes a term and termination clause and malpractice tale and non-compete and non-solicit are all in the physician manual or in the employee handbook, but aren't in the like letter of appointment or whatever they give you to sign for an academic job. Regardless of how they structure the writing, all of those writings make up your contract. So like, for example, If you're going there with the promise of a certain type of schedule, a certain amount of academic time, teaching time, research time, uh, if there were any specific promises that were made during the interview process that really motivated you to take that academic position, we should write them into the contract, see if we can get them included in that letter of understanding. Uh, I did one very recently where we literally just added, okay, here's what we would like the second paragraph of that letter to read. And it was in a very conversational form that explained exactly what the deal was and the goals and the proposed schedule and some of the specifics. Uh, That's a great way to go with academics. Look, at any time your employer, regardless of it's academics or private practice or hospital, at any time they can change compensation, they can change obligations. They really don't want to lose physicians, though. And I think generally folks in those positions also don't want to lie or misrepresent. They don't want to change. But then sometimes they just don't even know what the deal was. So, for example, in academics, if administration changes, the new folks coming in might not even know what the conversation was between you and the old department head when you started five years ago. They might have no clue unless it's written down somewhere either in your appointment letter or an extensive email exchange or whatever, they might not even know. They might want to honor it, but without some sort of writing, they might not have the internal leverage to honor that agreement. Remember, the department head might also answer to somebody else who answers to somebody else. Sometimes those writings give the folks above you Uh, a bit of a defense to folks that are above them that are asking for something different from the department. They say, well, I realize you want that thing, but here is what the institution promised this physician. Do you want to break that promise? And a lot of times they really don't. So it at least gives you uh, a leg to stand on, but also specifically with the exit strategy piece, if there's anything problematic about the exit from the academic job, then you want to try to include that in the letter or the contract or whatever you're signing about that job. Absolutely. And when we were talking about private practice in your career, a lot of private practice doctors hustle and just for the productivity, covering overhead, earning a salary they want, working towards 
partnership and they get burned out a lot of the times. And But that being said, on the academic and hospital employed side of things, those physicians can also burn out. We often hear about junior faculty members burning out or being stretched too thin due to the demand of meeting not only clinical productivity targets, as well as their you know administrative and research obligations, going back to the obligations element of the, the Trinity. There may also be more or less resident or APP support from one faculty member to the other. You know, and while, like you said, the senior physician may be getting the same paycheck as the new person coming on, or maybe I'm going to assume it's higher if they've gotten promotions and the professor or associate professor versus the assistant professor, but their productivity and bonus structure may not be that different. That being said, they still will get more residents or APP supporting their clinic. Maybe from a surgeon standpoint, they run two rooms in the hospital or a surgery center, uh, while the junior faculty member cannot do that, but their productivity targets aren't halved. You know, it's important for a junior faculty member also to be involved early in committees and administrative responsibilities. That's one of the most beautiful things about academic medicine is being able to grow your career in ways other than just seeing patients and taking care of patients. But it's also important not to be overburdened by this. And so how do graduates looking at academic positions protect themselves from these situations? This, you know, is one of the biggest risks of going into academics as a junior faculty member in a high throughput academic department, a lot of research demands, a lot of administrative demands, but also a lot of clinical demands. And you don't want to be in that position. Yeah, absolutely. Look, there are so many details to academic positions, so many issues to think about, so many ways that we can craft a job and craft some protections in your contract that can help you later on. I will say, though, that I do see more academic and like direct hospital employed physicians looking to leave and explore a private practice option, then I do the other direction for a number of reasons. I think that over time, some of the attractions of those jobs that might have been very powerful for first contract physicians sometimes start to lose their luster. It really just depends on what you want to do with your career and how you want your contract to affect your life, whether it fits into your life plan or not. Sometimes your life plan changes and it requires you to, to make an adjustment. But I will say just on a very macro level, I very rarely have physicians established in private practices that are like sustained and successful and going that then want to go into academia or direct hospital employed scenarios. And, you know, another thing we hear about is more and more articles, especially in these Medscape articles too, you know, can physician altruism ever be taken advantage of by these big healthcare employers? Have you heard about this theme? Absolutely. They know that physicians will always do right by their patients. It is ingrained in you guys to put the patients first and above everything at all times. I kind of push back on that a little bit. Sometimes things that are really good for a physician are also exceptional for patients in the long term. Sometimes hospital employed physicians face tons of pressure to expand their obligations to do more for less because they're pressed to serve patients more. This is good for patients. You got to serve your patients. And they're like guilt tripped and um, stuck in this odd scenario where they're constantly being pushed to do more with less because of patient demands. It's also just ingrained in you through medical school and residency and fellowship for a decade or more usually to do this. And I guess my general advice for folks coming out of training and going into really any setting, whether it's academic or hospital employed or private practice, is that your mindset has to shift a little bit. Okay, your time is valuable. It's incredibly valuable. During residency and fellowship, no one probably value your time very much. They kind of stepped on your time a little bit. But in these other settings, the script has to flip a little bit and your time is incredibly valuable. You should push back on unilateral expansion of your duties, things that either make that time far more stressful, like push more duties into the same amount of time or simply expand the amount of time that you're required to apply through the number of obligations and understand just how, how that impacts your life. Sometimes what's best for the physician is actually what is also best for the patient 
and some of those guilt trip kind of conniving, like phrasing of issues uh, is sometimes very unfair for physicians. I see a lot of physicians that come to me after being employed by hospitals for an extended period that uh, really the first thing I have to do is bring them back into reality. Like, no, 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 that is unfair. What they're saying to you is just not right. Your time is valuable. You should not be required to do all of these things for free. And we need to reset that relationship a little bit. What are some examples of that? When have you seen that, you know, phrasing done by a mega health or a hospital system? One that seems to pop up quite a bit. So my wife's a psychiatrist, so I end up representing quite a lot of psychiatrists. And it's with expanding supervision obligations for uh, nurse practitioners and physicians assistants and being required to do that for free for no additional compensation, kind of cramming more obligations into the same day. Imagine a scenario where the physician is only compensated on RVUs, but also has to do more things that don't create RVUs for them. And they're told, well, you kind of have to do this because it's better for patients and you should just sacrifice more. You know, the pressure to just continue to sacrifice more and more for the good of the patients can get really unhealthy, can lead to moral injury burnout. Uh, and we need to watch out for that. I see that more often in academic and hospital employed positions compared to private practices. You know, I hate to say it like this, but so they're asking for you to take on more liability, not just more obligation without any change in your RVU reimbursement. Exactly. Exactly. It's usually some sort of iteration of that, some sort of expanding obligation. Sometimes with liability, like you said, it's not necessarily like more charting, more paperwork, more patients, more meetings that they got to go to, more quality metrics that they need to evaluate and figure out. Sometimes it's with the liability side. But from a very macro level, it's just continuing to ask for more for the same or less compensation. And it can be relentless in some of these jobs. Like it can be every day, just constant. Uh, and we need to sometimes reset your mindset, your like relationship with your employer and reconsider. Interesting. You know, speaking of, you know, compensation, I guess we're changing gears a little bit, but how do hospital systems determine when they'll convert you to productivity rather than the expected guaranteed salary for however many years when you start an academic position or you start an employed position? You know, do you see physicians' compensations increase in the long term typically, or is the guaranteed salary the most they ever see? You know, that may be a bit of a loaded question, but I've heard of both scenarios. Absolutely. I think that one of the most important pieces of compensation of my analysis for a compensation plan is trying to estimate whether future compensation is going to be more or less than the initial offering. Sometimes the initial offering is really nice from a hospital. They might offer you a signing bonus plus a guaranteed minimum salary for maybe two or three years, and it can never go under that floor, and it's enough to like really get you stable and insecure. But if that number is too high, if the amount that you're going to earn after that base protection ends is lower, that can be really painful for your personal finance decision. Let's say you invested in a large home. Maybe you're, you live in a market where uh, there's not a lot of affordable housing. Fortunately, we're in Milwaukee and that's not the case. There actually is quite a bit here, but not everyone uh, has that, but it can be very painful. So an important question for me is not always what is the base during the first two years. It's how much is the employer currently paying per RVU and how many RVUs should you reasonably expect to make once you're established after the, usually it's two years. I'm going to assume it's, it's two years. After the two-year period, what do the majority of physicians working the same type of job usually create? And you want to maybe like remove the ones that are working time and a half. Some physicians in employed positions are working extra time and adding extra clinic hours and that sort of thing. You want to look at one that's doing the same amount of work as you expect to be doing, how many RVUs do they create? And what is their compensation? Is it going up or down? The value that an that, um, employer pays per RVU, we can lock it in for a certain period, but we can't lock it in forever. Okay, There's always going to be some sort of flexibility on it. 
Uh, it needs to be movable, hopefully movable up and not down. But understanding what that number is and comparing it to other offers, other employed scenarios can be more valuable. There's a number of times where I recommend a physician choose one employed position over another, not because of what the base salary is. Maybe the base salary during the first two years is about the same, but if one place is paying $65 per RVU and another place is paying $55 per RVU and the $65 per RVU place has uh, the same or more resources that they're providing the physician to help support their practice. Well, that's far more valuable than another 25K or 50K in signing bonus or a little bit more during your base. That's interesting. You know, we'll get into RBUs in a second here, but if you have obligations beyond clinical activity, I'm assuming a lot of, you know, academic places or employed positions there should be some other sort of compensation reimbursement for that effort, right? So if you do a teaching activities, then your productivity goal should be a little lower, right? In theory, you know, or if you have to run a number of committees or if you have dedicated research time, then unless you're bringing in grant money, there's got to be some other way that they're going to lower your RVU, your clinical productivity target. And that's an obvious thing, but have you ever seen situations where that's not the case? Yeah, a ton. So one of the more common reasons that hospital employed physicians call me trying to renegotiate their current deal. They want to stay in the job. They like the job, but they just want to renegotiate it. Okay. One of the more likely scenarios is that that physician accepted some non-clinical obligations that were not tied with the specific non-clinical compensation piece. For example, uh, like a directorship or some sort of leadership role within the hospital sometimes those might take up uh, a lot of your time. It might actually pull away from your clinical practice. You might even reduce some hours of your clinical practice and apply them there. But if there's not like a stipend or some specific additional amount of compensation tied to you performing that duty for the employer, then now you're taking on more obligations and agreeing to less compensation and like, as your physician contract lawyer, I don't want that. Like, that's not a good deal. So a lot of times we we might be asking for a renegotiated deal that includes like a 0.1 or a 0.2 FTE, some specific amount of set salary that is tied to performing an administrative function. I would say just generally be wary of titles or duties that do not also come with a specific amount of compensation attached to it. Sometimes your employer is simply asking for free work, and I'm not a big fan of anyone giving away free work. Speaking of RVUs, you know, can you briefly review, you know, for new graduates, you know, what is an RVU? How do they calculate it? And other than comparing to other employment contracts, how are you supposed to know if the RVU dollar amount is reasonable? Yeah, so RVUs are tied to various functions, activities that you do as a physician. You see a patient, you perform a surgery, you do whatever it is that you're doing. Pretty much everything that you're doing has a CPT code and an RVU attached to it. So it's important for you as a physician to understand what activities lead to more RVUs. If you're in a surgical specialty, Usually performing surgeries will lead to more RVUs per unit of time. Like if you spend more OR time compared to others in your specialty, often that will lead to more RVUs per hour of work and correlatedly more compensation. It's a little bit different in each type of practice. For some specialties, a number in the four or 5,000 is all that's reasonable for them. Some specialties, 10 or 15,000 RVUs is completely reasonable. Sometimes the same type of work in the same type of job with different employers, you should expect different RVUs. What you really need to know is what are other physicians doing my type of work making in RVUs? How hard are they working? How many clinical hours are they providing? How much OR time are they providing? What's going on? And then... How many RVUs is that work creating? And that can vary wildly. It's incredibly difficult on my side 
to estimate uh, how many RVUs a physician is going to create unless the employer provides like data back to us that explains that. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's Version Hess and Yvonne Ovijinsky. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Kinnebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.